Welcome to Performance Anxiety, proud member of the Pantheon Podcast Network. This show expands on my continuing fascination with the band Swans. I'm joined by Jarbo. She was one of the longest tenured members of Swans outside of founder Michael Girard, but she also has a prolific solo career that extends beyond music. Jarbo shares some truly wild stories of touring with Swans that include getting smuggled into Eastern Bloc countries by political dissidents, riots in Germany when their shows were cut short, and sometimes just being a dork. She also talks about the inspiration behind her latest album, Illusory. And she's not hard to find on social media. Just search Living Jarbo. You can't miss her. Follow us at Performance ANX on the socials. Subscribe, rate, review. And if you like the show, consider supporting us through Kofi.com. That's ko-fi.com slash performance anxiety. You can do a one-time donation or a recurring one. Now let's dive right into Jarbo on performance anxiety. Uh, okay. Okay, yeah, uh, my name is Jarbo, and you're listening to Performance Anxiety. Uh, my website is thelivingjarbo.com. Hi, Jarbo. Hi. Hi, how are you? Uh, well, <laughs> I don't know. How is everyone right now? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'm, I mean, I, I'm announced that, you know, uh, various interviews I've done uh, since the release of the loser, and I, and I think... Uh, I think the best answer I gave was, um, that's the existential question, is it not? Yes. <laughs> so, um, I don't know. I mean, I think, uh, what, you know, it's been like for me is, is, um, what I hear, uh, other people, uh, friends, um, saying the same thing for them, that there's good days and bad days, because it is a, a, a you know, a, an experience that none of us have ever had before. So, yes. so it's, um, you know, it's up and down. Yeah, it, <laughs> it, it is. The fear factor, the fear factor, of course, is, is a big problem, as well as the ennui. Yeah. And of course, uh, now my new concern is I'm looking online to buy, uh, you know, one of the shields because I've been wearing medical grade masks when I have to go out. Yes. But if I'm forced to go stand in line to vote because of some kind of a, um, corruption of the, uh, you know, messing with the post office for, for voting in the mail, then of course I will have to be doing that. So I'm going to be armed. I'm going to have a medical grade mask, <laughs> shield. You know, I'm going to be completely armed, just like my friend is a nurse in Seattle. She says, well, that's how we, you know, arm ourselves when we are, are treating COVID patients. So yeah. I'll be, you know, because nothing is stopping me from voting. Oh, no. Earthquake. A bomb, bomb <laughs> going on is stopping me from voting. <laughs> Everybody I'll, shouldn't I'll do that. Everybody needs to do that. Yes. <laughs> but I mean, I, I, haven't, I haven't missed... Um, an election since I was a legal age to vote. Uh, even all the touring I've done, I've, I've voted oh, wow. absentee ballot. So I've, I'm, a, uh, and of course I've done, uh, done many, many, uh, done a lot of work for, for campaigns, uh, all Democrat campaigns. Right. And, and, uh, so I'm very, very motivated. Spin Magazine years ago, years ago, Spin was around, asked me to write a, uh, a piece about uh, rock the vote, and so I mean, I've I've been very vocal about oh, wow. about things like rocking the vote, and then before it became fashionable, I was very vocal about wearing earplugs in a concert situation. Yeah, and um, when, when I started doing it, you know, when I started doing it, I made a dramatic gesture out of it, like I'd, I'd walk on stage without them, I'd stand there, you know, on the edge of the stage with a keyboard, I'd very dramatically remove them one by one and put them on. <laughs> Wait for that. People People were, people were watching yeah. to prepare them. Uh, guess what? We're the decimal level of a jet aircraft taking off. Yes. So yes. <laughs> yes. Which we were. I, I know. I'm, which we were. We were the loudest band in the world at one time. And so, yes. So, I mean, so this is, and, and I don't have tinnitus, and I think it's because of the fact that I was always, the, you know, I've always been a geek and a dork. And so I've always <laughs> been like, wear the earplugs. Oh, and man. I wish I had when I was starting to see concerts. 
Um, well, you know, Michael has has never worn them, and it just makes me furious. But there's nothing; it, it's out of my hands now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'm not in. I'm not in charge. You right. know? But, I mean, every everybody else, everybody else does. Yeah. And 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 so all, people don't understand all these ferocious metal bands. They're all wearing earplugs. Yeah, yeah. Not, you just, just can't see them. This, this is their this is their income. This is their livelihood. They're exactly. not going to go deaf for you people. They're going to subject you to it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But they're, they're there night after night. They're, they're going to try to protect themselves as much as possible. Yeah, because nobody wants that horrible ringing in your ears. No. So anyway, I think, uh, I think you know, those are the two, two like super dorky things. Like, don't drink, don't smoke, don't do drugs, wear earplugs, and vote. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> how boring, how, how, how unrock. Yeah. <laughs> but, well, responsible rock now. Now it's responsible rock. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, things have changed. Yeah, they really have. And, I wanted to, to first of all thank you for coming on the show. It, it's I'm just really excited to have you on. This is this is just great. I'm a and I'm gonna be totally uh, upfront. I'm actually kind of new to Swans and your music. I remember I was in college in the early '90s, and I remember when uh, White Light from the Mouth of Infinity came out, and I heard it once. A friend of mine had it, and it kind of scared and unsettled me and so i didn't go back Mm -hmm. to it until recently uh literally maybe Mm -hmm. a year ago i started uh actually when uh, i started doing this podcast uh one of the guys that helped me get some of the great guests i've had said hey uh michael draw is going to be doing you know a limited press if you're interested you know i can schedule him for your podcast and i was like Oh, that'd be great. And that's when I had mm-hmm. to go back and start, you know, acquainting myself with swans and, and yeah, all. Yeah, sure. And so I don't know everything. I'm not a swans expert by any means. Um, and I'm not, right. a, I'm not well, a jarbo expert. That's probably good. Yeah. <laughs> that's probably actually great. But I'm actually, I'm actually fascinated by him, by you, by the band, the sound, the music. Mm-hmm. And so it's, uh, I'm, I'm learning as I go. So if uh, you and listeners, if I'm asking some questions that everybody already knows the answers to, to, I'm going to say right up front that I'm just, I'm still a swan's novice. So, and uh, fun, yeah. I want to know a little bit more about how you got to where you are right now. And you were born in Mississippi, but grew up in mm-hmm. New Orleans. So, you know, I know New Orleans music is everywhere. And so was, was music a, like a big part of your childhood growing up? Oh yes, very much so. Um, I mean, it can't be, uh, overstated how musical my father was. He uh, had a beautiful singing voice. He played guitar. He played uh, the Hammond organ. He, oh, cool. he, um, he, he, he had a massive music collection of records. And, and um, I, I grew up learning the very old, old-fashioned songs, oh, like the songs from, from uh, I don't know, 30s, 40s, 50s. And, and, and so uh, he, uh, when he discovered that I had a, a musical ability, uh, I could sing the notes that he pressed down and I could carry a tune you know when I was just a little baby little kid he uh he then he then uh encouraged uh, to bring that out of me so then that that was what opened the door to a lifetime of uh, music lessons and 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 every every possible choir and school and and church and and outside choirs and every possible training uh, training on the on the organ training on the piano training a vocal coach for years and years and years and and so um, what was interesting about this was it kind of kept me isolated uh, musically and then when I um, started uh, expanding my hearing, you know, to hear things that I had been conditioned to not hear as music. So, oh, really? so I began hearing, uh, you know, experimental and, and, uh, you know, of things that were using distorted guitar and that kind of thing. And, and then hearing singing that my coach would say was improper singing technique. And that would be contemporary singing using breath and using, uh, you know, more what you call common way of approaching singing. Okay. And so um, this was a, a big turning point. And uh, when I first 
was listening to this uh, radio show from Georgia Tech that was doing experimental music on Sunday evenings. Oh, cool. And so that's when I first heard a lot of this stuff, like SDK, Unstars and Denoy Balton, oh, yeah, uh, yeah. Cabaret, Vol- Cabaret Voltaire, Throbbing Gristle, Can. Um, I mean, the list is endless. And, and so this is what opened the door to um, when I first heard uh, Power for Power, which is a song on the Filth album. Yes. And Swan's Filth album. And what I liked about that particular track was the um, mantra-like uh, quality of it, that it repeated over and over, and it sounded quite tribal, yes. and, and it really drew me in as, as a composition. I knew nothing about the people behind it, so I looked for the record, and I found it from the radio station, who it was, and I looked for it. Of course, it was nowhere to be found. Right. There was no yeah. distribution. Yeah. And so I finally um, thought about it, and I just had the... I just had the the courage and tenacity and just ferocious uh, interest to, to, to go to the radio station and I borrowed their actual copy. Oh, wow. And, um, and it was the radio station copy and I, and I, um, you know, I never returned it. I mean, I, <laughs> I stole it. <laughs> terrible. It's terrible. Oh, you should send them a new I, copy. I feel bad. I feel bad. <laughs> but, but I did return the favor because shortly thereafter, when I started doing performance work using contact mics and, and doing things on little obscure DIY art galleries, I then uh, performed on the radio station oh, and live, and and then I I did work with one of the DJs there who knew how to operate some of the, the gear, and so it was my first introduction to recording in a uh, experimental way. Oh, cool! So you and did return so, the favor. Well, I returned the favor by by inputting music. I guest hosted a, a, as a DJ, and uh-huh. I, I performed live down there. And so, I mean, I kind of got involved with the station. So I think that um, you know, I helped and I returned the favor in that way. I guess. I'd say. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, but, but I mean, um, but see, this was very important because when I heard that. There was an address on the back of the record because yeah. there was no lyric sheet and it said write for lyric sheet. So um, I, I wrote like a postcard or something to the address of uh, the, the little independent record label mm-hmm. on the back of the, uh, to New York on the back of the, of the, and then I got a, uh, I got a, a, I don't know, months later, I don't remember now, I got a, a, a response back from Michael. Oh, cool. Um, and, it, and it was a very interesting kind of letter, and the lyrics were there. And it was, I think I've still got it. I've still got it. Oh, typed wow. up lyric sheet that he mailed and addressed to me. And, um, and he goes, and he wrote on there in, in ink something like, a, you know, here they are, such as they are. Here's yes. the lyrics. <laughs> <laughs> and it was very self effacing, you know, and yeah. kind of humble. And that, that made me even more interested because it sounded so sincere oh. and not pompous, you know. And, yeah. and so, um, so, so that kind of opened the door, and I wrote back. So this was all through the mail. Yeah, so this is exchange. So this is taking and, uh, I told months. Him about my, yeah, I told him about my work, you know, that I was starting to do, and finally I sent him a cassette of some different stuff I was doing, and he was uh, impressed with the variety of the stuff I was doing. Uh, vocally, and then I was using a, a 16 second digital delay sampler, electro harmonics oh, cool. uh, digital delay unit, and I had the very first one. That would enable you to layer tracks just in this unit, and then the track that you recorded would come back and you could add to it, and then it would come back and add to it, and then eventually the original ones would kind of fade in a very ethereal way, and you could press a button and then have it all come back as this massively layered coral kind of a thing, oh, right? wow. So I sent him a tape of me doing that stuff, and he was apparently blown away by that, and then I was going up there anyway to attend some classical music performances at oh. Carnegie Hall oh, wow. Lincoln Center. 
and I was going to, you know, I was going to the Met, and I was going to go to all these things up there. So I, um, and so while I was up there staying um, in Midtown near Lincoln Center, I um, uh, was also working with a zine because you know these were the days of zines. I mean, I was working with an art zine that we would take and photocopy. Okay. So uh, they wanted me to interview, try to do an interview with the, with Swans. Oh wow! And so I uh, was invited to come down to the bunker, the studio. And of course, that's where I wound up living for all those years. Oh, man. So I went down there and it was just raw space. Yeah, yeah. Raw concrete space. And there was a heavy steel door on the street. Go in there. And they had, uh, in a very funky way, put up carpeting and that kind of thing to try to soundproof it, which was a joke. It wasn't. <laughs> and and um, so, th- so that was, I was not allowed into the actual room, which is probably great because I would have been deaf. Yes. So I was able to sit outside the door of the, uh, of, of the actual room where they were. And my God. It was so loud, and all the walls are rumbling, and oh. it was just unbelievable. So I was able to hear them rehearsing, and it was just, just brutal. So, wow. uh, I, so then when they came out, then um, I met them all, and then I, I went, we went to Life Cafe, which I know is no longer there, but Life Cafe was quite famous for a while. I think it was in Time Magazine. Anyway, so, mm-hmm. so we went to Life and then I um, uh, started interviewing him. And Michael, and so so that was how we became friends, and that was how this kind of rapport started. And I expressed my interest in yeah you know, being part of that scene, yeah, yeah, being part of that world, and that I'd be willing to come up there. And Jeez. so then, um, then, and, and of course, another added factor to this that I was studying a type of martial arts, a kickboxing, kick kickboxing. Oh, really? And I'm um, like a yeah, I was like a bondo boxer. So I had these very ferocious kick moves and I had calluses on the sides of my hands from chopping, you know, hitting, uh, hitting cement blocks. Oh my God. And so, and I had a buzz cut and I only wore athletic gear like bike shorts and, and, uh, wrestling boots. Oh wow. So anyway, so, so this is the person that he met. And so I think that I looked tough enough to be able to, to come up there and to, <laughs> yeah. to help, you know, and I did. And I came up there, and I, the, on the very first tour of, that they did in 1984, I wasn't in the band. I was like a, you know, like a, a, a schlepper, a person hauling the drums and helping the new amps, and okay. just really almost like a glorified roadie, you know. Oh. Like a, and it was a brutal tour, brutal tour, because they all chain smoked and in the van, <laughs> and they, uh, of course, I, of course, I was teetotal. Right. Completely straight edge. Yeah. So they were also hardcore drinkers, like massively. And I hadn't, I, that was kind of a shock because I didn't drink at all. So, yeah, so I would be the stone cold sober person with oh, all the yeah. chain smoking drunks. <laughs> and they would be so drunk they couldn't, you know, they couldn't even climb up the stairs to go to the hotel. I mean, they, or they, they were just, wow. so anyway, and, and, and the smoking was unbelievable. I was getting full of toxic oh. poisons because I couldn't breathe and it was horrible. But, but, but the good thing about that was is, is I went into it completely aware of what, what I was, you know, going to be dealing with. Yeah, yeah. And I was still fascinated by the live sound. I was still fascinated by the music and um, kind of unstoppable. And, and so I was willing to have the naive notion that I would change things to fit me right. rather than I would, that I would not become, one, become like that. Okay. Yeah. And that was that was really the source of tension the entire time is because I never never went to the bars. I was never part of the bar scene. I the rehearsal would end, I would open up the little vent that we had to let out the cigarette smoke <laughs> and I would get to work. I would just get to work playing by myself and, wow. and, and working on my own compositions. And they would go out and, and, and there was a whole scene up there with all these musicians yeah. and they would go to after hours bars and they would, I mean, but you know, these are bars, they'd come in at, you know, the sun be coming up. Right. Yeah. And I, and, of course, and so this, see, I never was part of that. So see, then again, the dork, you know, the nerve, like yes. I wasn't cool. <laughs> <laughs> I was never cool because I never partied. Yeah. And I'm not saying, I'm not judging it. I'm simply saying I, it's not something I ever felt comfortable with. Right. It's too different worlds. 
Yeah. So, so in other words, we could meet on a on on an artistic level as time went by, but you got but then people it had nothing to do with introducing. Even though I did introduce melody, it had nothing to do with that. Ultimately, it had to do with I was able to adapt. And so the very first thing I did uh, recording wise was a blood curdling scream. <laughs> That which opens, um, you know, opened a track, and then I went on to doing choral vocals on Holy Money, and then I yes. went on to introducing melody and playing keyboards and adding a tremendous amount of background vocals, and then finally the lead vocals and uh, Children of God. And before Children of God, you know, we had done the Skin albums, and that was those were done before Children of God. So you, okay. Blood, Women, Roses, Blood, Women. Roses is basically my first solo album, but we decided to call it a project. Right, yes. Um, skin, and it became World of Skin Instead of Skin because there was a band in New Jersey or something that oh. <laughs> had the name Skin. <laughs> and so. I was going to ask about how that came up. We would have to buy the name. And oh. then we wanted a huge amount of money. And so, so we decided just to change the name to World of Skin. But see, that was, that was a very uh, melodic. Yeah. album, The Blood Moon Roses. And so you can see how that then went over to Children of God. Yeah, so yeah, that's sure. how it opened up this whole portal of, I guess what you call uh, more melodic, complex, intricate kind of harmonies and stuff that, that entered into the Sound of Swan. So it's yeah. a pretty radical change. Yeah, it really was. The first album. Yeah. <laughs> now, before, you know, going back to hearing Swans for the first time, had you thought about pursuing singing and music as a career? Yes, but uh, as I got older, um, I I wanted to pursue what was not recognized as real music. I wanted right. to pursue uh, more rock and, and pop kind of stuff. Right. And so that was a source of tension between me and my father. And, and so, I mean, a big source of tension. Right. And so that was kind of the the breaking point was I began to form my own identity and that identity was quite frankly was never accepted. Yeah. It was always, I believe, a huge disappointment. And I think until he died, I think I was still um a disappointment because I uh, he didn't understand my, um, you know, my interest in things that were kind of groundbreaking and, move, and moving forward rather than mm-hmm. um, perfecting the old ways. Yeah. I wanted to move forward with something that wasn't even recognized as music, to be honest. It was just considered noise. Right. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Now, what, what did your mother think of, of all of this at the time? And, and, and how did she look at, at your career and swans in particular? Well, she was, um, she was, the interesting thing about their dynamic, I've reflected upon it, you know, many times in the, as years have gone by. She was supportive. And, um, I think that he was the issue, and I think she was very supportive. Uh, she would secretly send me money when I was in New York to try to help me. Oh, wow. And, uh, wow. she, um, she, when we were, uh, uh, the first tour when the band was stranded in London, I, you know, I had a return ticket from Belgium. Okay. Uh, I had a round trip, I had a round trip ticket on that tour, and of course I had no way to get back there because I was traveling with them. So I would so that man, I missed my return ticket. Oh. I was stranded in England and there was a lot of problems there with um, sneaking people into rooms because, you know, you can, can only have, you can only pay for the person, not the room. Oh, so there was wow. a lot of, they were sneaking in and out of the room and all that. And I, I'm pretty sure I was paying for, for my own room and um, credit card. And so I think that, um, you know, there was a lot of <clears throat> difficulties there financially. So I remember walking to, this is the days of pay phones, I remember walking to the phone and attempting to call 
call and I had to call home and I had to call her and just say, can you please wire me some money? Oh, wow. <laughs> I got, because I maxed out my card. I got maxed out my card on that tour. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> so, wow. Yeah, so she was there to help me all the time. You know what I mean? She yeah. helped me. And, yeah, so I think she was supportive. But here's the big difference. The big difference was she was basically tone deaf. Oh, she wow. could not sing. And so I think I was the only one of the three children that could sing. And, and I think this was why my father was so excited when he discovered this, because I was the baby, you know, the youngest. And I oh, think that he, yeah. um, I think he, you know, he, he was thrilled that he finally had a kid that had music. <laughs> yeah. Whereas the, my two brothers and my mom, really, they had no, t- and not only did they, they just were unable to sing, you know, yeah. they were unable to carry a tune. So, see, that's the difference. Like, she was supportive just because of she loved her love for me. Yeah. And I think he, I think he was very strict, you know, kind yeah. of uh, expectations of me. And it, and that extended itself not only to music; it extended that to every realm of my life. I mean, and it was just um. impossible. It's like it's like it's like you're it's one of those situations where you're never good enough. You're never good enough. Yeah. So, oh, so it's... you can never please. So it was like that, where she would be more compassionate. So it's okay. like there was a real real gap between the two of them. There really was. Well, in, in, along those lines, Swan's fans are also pretty intense. Did they accept you right away when you started uh, you know, being a front person in the band? No. The, the very first tour, see, I didn't sing the first tour. Right, I yeah. played uh, the Insonic Mirage, and they were like slabs of loud sound. This thing was incredibly loud and brutal, and it would have a lot of percussion sounds in it. And It was just really kind of the early days of sampling keyboards, you know. And yeah. they, I, think, I think I had the very first one. I had the very first in Sonic Mirage. Oh, wow. And this was what Michael had wanted me to contribute to the sound because they always used, they always used noises and stuff as part of the sound, but those yeah. were recorded onto a cassette and they were played. The, the bass player had a foot pedal connected to the cassette deck and he would roll the sound up and down in volume throughout oh, the entire wow. set. So that particular bass player quit. And so then Michael said he wanted something to replace that that element. And so that was became the Insonic Mirage. Okay. And that thing was a it was a beast because there was no <laughs> monitor. You were dealing with parameters. Oh, so wow. it wasn't like today when you cook it up to your computer monitor and you can see a screen. Yeah. This was purely based on numbers. Oh my and so gosh. it had this big, it had a manual the size of a, you know, the old giant phone book. Yeah. <laughs> and all it was was parameters, like, oh, no, like wow. mathematical equations oh, to wow. correct your sound. Oh so that was a nightmare going through that that manual, and uh, and then the thing was it was a I was like a beta tester for it on the road because it was a sensitive piece of electronic equipment, yeah. and I I determined at the end of, of a long tour that we did that it was not a road worthy instrument. <laughs> <laughs> it was it, not only was it susceptible to temperature. Oh. cold and heat, but it was also susceptible to um, voltage. So oh, you're talking wow. about a band that drew like every bit of juice in their venue. Yeah, I bet. Like sucked it out of the PA. <laughs> the very early shows, the very early shows, we blew the electric. Oh. We blew the fuses wow. over and over during the set. Oh, my God. And you can listen to those early recordings, and, like, the song will suddenly stop because we've blown the electric again. Wow. So what happened with the keyboard, with the Mirage, is then you'd have to reboot the system with the operating system disk. Oh, my God. So you'd have to, you'd have to put that in there. And that would take a while to oh. reboot the entire system. And then you'd have to put in your particular diskettes that had the sounds on them. Oh, my God. So, see, once you were at a commission electrically, you missed the entire song waiting to get back in the game. Oh, my <laughs> gosh. 
Jeez. I know. And this happened for years and, and, and I could not wait to get rid of that thing. And then finally it, it um, and, and then, oh yeah. And then we had to send it off to Malvern, Pennsylvania, where the, where the factory was to get it repaired. Oh, we wow. even drove there a couple of times. Oh my God. And it had to get repaired. And when they returned it, this is hilarious. This is a New York story. <laughs> when they returned it, we had to go pick it up at some shipping area, right? Right. And of course, we were having a, one of our famous blizzards, and they had dropped it into a snowbank. Oh my God! <laughs> like the worst thing you could possibly do to a piece of electronic yeah. equipment. Oh my God! So this is the hell I went through. The, the, this thing took years off my life. I'm sure I was oh. constantly stressed out about this keyboard. Oh my God! And then. When we, we took this thing, this is insane. This is just like an insane. We took this thing on the Eastern European tour. Oh, wow. We were like, I think pretty sure the first Western band to do this tour. We went into communist, socialist countries. Yeah. We went into wow. what was called Yugoslavia. We yeah. went into what was called Czechoslovakia. We went into Prague, we rolled into Prague at three in the morning. There were a hammer and sickle flags, bright red, blowing off of the buildings. Wow. And, and we were illegal. We had to be smuggled by dissidents oh. and meet to do these shows. Wow. And these people that, that smuggled us around. Um, you know, they were professors, doctors, they were, you know, they oh, were yeah. super intellectuals and they'd all been reduced to, um, well, not, you know, they'd all been chained to being street cleaners. Yeah. That kind of thing. Yep. They'd lost their position. And so they put us up in their homes and they snuck us in and we did shows that were uh, only announced through the grapevine and underground. Oh and there would be shows like underneath the street and, and former like cellars. Wow. And um, it, it was really funky, you know, and, and uh, it, was, it was incredibly informative and, and uh, enlightening to see that. So the point was, is I had this machine with me. <laughs> and, I mean, you can imagine the audience like, you know, their, their heads completely sideways like yeah. what is that yeah exactly and nobody had seen anything like it and so people would come up want to touch it and look at it oh, and I, I often used to say to Michael it's like that movie when the coke bottle or something drops into Africa the gods must be like, crazy it's like it's, yeah it's, it's it's like it's like I, I think I changed history somehow <laughs> <laughs> that was you a know? great movie I love that movie We'll be right back after a word from our sponsors. But here's, here's the crazy thing about this instrument. Because of its value, I'm, I remember paying 1200 for it. Okay, well, that's a lot of money in those days. And the yeah. case, the, ca- the, the calzone, calzone case, that thing was also worth hundreds of dollars. So the point was, it was a little expensive in those days. So... We would stay in these hotels, you know, that were not exactly, you know, they're in Europe. They have no elevators. They have, so you'd have to, I I remember in Amsterdam in particular where the the stairs go straight up, right? Literally straight up, like you're going into the attic, straight up. And I would have to take this thing out of the van and I'd have to get it into the lobby and then I'd have to shove it pull it, push it all the way up these stairs to oh, my room. Geez. So at any moment, you know, this thing could fall and take your head off. Yeah. <laughs> it could fly back. Oh my so that, God. So this brutal carrying this thing around, like, you know, it was unbelievable. And of course, the, the whole idea was you have to carry your own stuff. I mean, you, you're, you're on your own with your gear. Yeah. So no one helped me. Oh, and it was geez. pretty hardcore because it was very, very heavy and very, very big. It sounds like it could be a metal. Movie. Yeah, well, well, this thing, I, you know, anyway, so I finally got rid of it when, 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 you know, when we went on to me renting a Yamaha and then hooking it up to an Akai sampler in, in, in a rack mount oh, with wow. effects units and the rack mount. So that was fine because then if the electric went off, the only thing you had to worry about was rebooting your, your sampler machine and not the entire system itself. <laughs> yeah. So that changed my life. And then not having to worry about the keyboard, just getting it when you got in Europe, you know. Oh, cool. And okay. So that changed my life for the better. But this, this, this introduction 
you know, with this thing. So, so to answer your question, the long one answer, um, you know, the very first shows, um, oh no, um, trial by fire. I mean, yeah. spit at objects uh, thrown at me, beer, beer bottles barely missing my head, um, screaming and yelling. Entire audience, early shows, skinheads. Entire audience. Wow. So they did not like me at all. Oh my gosh. Jeez. And I remember, uh, I remember in uh, a show, we, one of the earliest shows we did in Yugoslavia, which is now uh, Ljubljana, Slovenia. Okay. The entire, it was an outdoor show, the entire uh, stage area mm-hmm. was full of slivers of broken glass. Ooh. So they had to kind of like try to sweep some of that out of the way, you know, to even go on to the stage. Oh, wow. and, and when I remember, then I had, I had started singing a bit during the show then, and I remember some guys laughing, and they started pelting me with fruit. Oh. Like, and so it was like mushy fruit, oh. and they hit me. They hit me all over the front of my body with this fruit while I was singing. So in other words, you know, what I developed um, during all this time was just to not even blink my eyes and to just keep on going no matter what, which is what I did. Wow. I never flinched. I never stopped. I just kept on going no matter what happened around me. And that's the way it was. It was brutal. The, the most famous of all these, well, I mean, I was hit many times. I yeah. was slapped. I was hit. I was knocked down. Oh, God. And, and the most, um, one of the most legendary in my, my own personal history of these would be the Boston Rat, which is no longer there, the Rothskeller. Oh. And this venue was, um, you know, a hardcore punk venue. Mm. And um, so that one, this is a show you what, what women would go through. And I guess I was unusual because it was in a woman, that, a woman in the band that was, I guess the sound would be considered quite testosterone and macho. I mean, yeah. there weren't really any women interested in, in swans <laughs> in those days. So, so, uh, I, I, uh, I, I was upstairs. They had an area upstairs for us to eat. So we had finished eating and then they closed off the, um, back entrance to the stage for some reason. Mm. So you had to go through the crowd, getting in the door to go through the audience and oh, then push geez. yourself up on stage. Oh, geez. So, that, so, so see, that was a normal occurrence. So, so that wasn't a problem at all okay. to me. But, th- but I realized the door was locked. I had to go through the audience. So I go down the stairs. And it's, it's pandemonium. I mean, it's packed. So I go down the stairs. And, of course, there are these big, scary-looking men, bouncers, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so... You know, I'm, I'm going through, I'm just saying, and I'm just kind of waving my hand, like, okay, I got him, and I point to the stage. They don't believe me. Uh-huh. And one of them, I go past him, one of them, he grabs me by the shoulder, and he throws me up against the wall. And then I said, no, I got to get to the stage, the stage. And, and, and you have to shout, and everybody's screaming, it's very loud. Yeah. He doesn't believe me. And then Michael, I look over and I see Michael's on stage pacing back and forth like he's angry as hell. Yeah. Because I'm not there. Because, you know, I'd had to go to the bathroom after I ate food. So I'm trying to get up there. And I would have made it no problem, but I was stopped. Oh. So there's no one to ask. We didn't have any laminates. I mean, this is like punk rock day. So, right. like, yeah. so, so I'm like, you know, and I was there for the sound check, of course, but I yeah. guess this guy wasn't there. Oh, wow. So anyway, to get to the point, it wound up with me like, you know, just trying to do my job and just, I turned around, I was just like, Oh, I, I think I actually did say, fuck you. Fuck you. I'll show you. I'm part of the band. <laughs> Let me prove it to you. Yeah. I'll prove it to you. So I just p- proceed to push my way through, you know, the, and get down there. And here, here I feel this hand. He grabs me. And then he takes his boot and he kicks me. And he kicks me over and over and over again. Oh, my God. So at that point, I'm hurt. So, so then another man who's also a bouncer there, he was quite famous. He had a voice box. Oh, wow. And he comes up, he comes up, and in his voice box, he says, you know, shut up, you know, no, no, you know, she's hard, no, leave her alone. Oh, and so, so, so then the guy stopped. 
So then I had to get up and climb on all fours against the wall with people coming down steps to go back to the toilet because I had literally lost control of myself um, in my underwear. I mean, I'm yeah. telling you, I know, I know what that means now because it's happened to me once in my life. So anyway, because <laughs> you're terrified, you know, you're being... So, yeah, oh my God. So then I had to go back down to get onto stage, oh, hoping gosh. this guy remembers I'm in the group. So I see the promoter, and I say to the promoter, hey, look, I'm just trying to get to the show, and let me tell you something, the way I've been treated here, like, uh, you know, this venue, is, we're, ne- this is, we're never going to play here again. I'm telling you that right now. Yeah. And her exact word, the, her, the promoter's exact words were, no one cares what you think. Oh, wow. Right? So then, of course, today it'd be Lawsuit City. Yeah, no So anyway, so, <laughs> so, so, so I walked back down the stairs. This time, they looked at me, and as I went by, the particular bouncer, that had, he, yelled, he yelled out to me, Troublemaker! Oh, jeez. Oh, my <laughs> God. Can you believe it? Meanwhile, you. meanwhile, we were on the, the local music zine for Dawson. We were on the cover. So this guy didn't uh, even know, you know, or believe me when I told him I was still picture. So that shows you what I was up against wow. as a female. That's... You just, there's, uh, there's no way that you could be in the band. Yeah, yeah. Oh, my gosh. That's unbelievable. Yeah. And, and, I know. It's endless. It's endless. That kind of stuff was endless. Uh, it's just endless. So it, it did so, take a little while for you to to get accepted by the fans and and, and well, everybody remember, else in the industry. I, I remember I remember very distinctly uh, Michael his exact words were you know I think he even said it in interviews in those days we wanted to I had had to get rid of that audience yeah. change audience didn't want that audience anymore because it was so mean and so brutal and so it was only men it was only well, boys it was only guys yeah. and and uh, they were uh, just wanted to be just they just wanted to be brutalized they just wanted loud brutality and there's yep. only so long you can keep doing that you know and, and have any interest in what you're doing as an artist you know exactly yeah so so, I mean, the thing about it is, is I always saw it as an art project. I always saw it as a project. I always, I never saw it as a rock band. I always saw it as an art project. You're talking about a person who went to art school. You know, he and yeah. Tim Gordon went to art school together in Los Angeles. They're artists who decided to try to, to use music, uh, you know, expressing their artistry. That's my opinion of it. Mm-hmm. And that is, I'm standing with that. I'm standing with that because yeah. there, wasn't, there wasn't any macho element behind what he was doing and the early lyrics were not about literal you know they were about they were they were metaphors yeah like raping a slave that was not about raping that was right. about uh, that was about the worker boss relationship exactly. and that was about uh, uh, working people uh, you know, too hard without any any respect or money, and this was a theme that went through all of that early, all of that uh, the abuse of power. I mean, that this is something that was a theme even today, I believe. So, so yeah. in other words, this was this was what I saw, and this is what I, why I was attracted to it. Right. it had, and, and the and the and the, the sound quality of it, I was attracted to because to me it sounded, um, you know, forward. It sounded groundbreaking. Yeah. There's no one doing anything quite like it. Exactly. And so I, I always, I had the ears to, to accept that and I, from the very beginning. So I think, you know, it was natural for me that, to, to be part of it, not to mention the fact that I was extremely buff in those days. And so I was right. completely fearless yeah. about the physicality of it. And um, to my credit, I was never mugged. I was never bothered in any way in the most dangerous neighborhood in, in New York. And wow. so, so when I, when we went up, when I moved in there, I mean, my God, it was just, you know, just take your life in your hands going out the door. Yeah, I've, I've seen nothing some, but, some photos of me. There's nothing but drug dealers, yeah. drug dealers. And I wrote some very intimate autobiographical lyrics for Justin Broderick for his Yezu project. 
uh, called Storm Coming On, and that was and the lyrics described literally what it was like on a day by day basis. Open the door, puddle of urine, hypodermic needles everywhere. You know that this yeah. was the this was the reality of, of the you know the Lower East the East Village, you know Avenue B and Sixth Street, the East Village uh, in the eighties. You know this was um, a no man's land. came up there uh, or out there like me because of the fact that you were seen as encroaching uh, gentrificationers who would kick them out eventually with the real estate going up. And so there was a lot of hostility from the residents that were, were living up there then. And so there was a constant harassment. And, and, um, and I had never seen, growing up in the South, I had never seen racism until I moved to New York. And that is when I saw it for the very first time, and I saw how nasty it was. Yeah, you know I'm, that does not surprise me. I, I lived in, uh, I I grew up between Virginia and New Jersey, and then uh, in my I don't know mid twenties, so I ended up moving down to Alabama, and then back up to Virginia. So yeah, I, I know what you mean. Back in in that time, yeah, my parents we would go into New York City occasionally and, and yeah and I remember how dangerous something my parents would always we'd always they always have to have, you know even almost as like teenagers we'd have to be, like grab onto each other and we'd make sure you're, we're all yeah. going in the same direction you know, we're all close to, close in you know like circle the wagons as we walk down the street and, and I remember that yeah, and, and the beautiful thing about it is that it, my experience in that music and that situation early on live as well as uh, living there is that the, the that uh, stays with you the rest of your life yeah. and what good what is good about it is that it's it's it gives you um a skill set a technique that toughens you but it also makes you kind of smart and savvy in terms of not getting um taken advantage of yes. and, or duped and you have eyes around the back of your head you have a vision that circles around yeah. and so so I learned that very very quickly walking the sidewalk and to to walk into the middle of the street and then I learned Michael taught me this to have a glass bottle like a water bottle or whatever empty and you would just swing it as you walked down the middle of the street oh wow especially in, in the especially at night because oh, that gave the message that you you you, you know like maybe you've been in the pen you know like yeah <laughs> <laughs> like you can take that bottle you can take that bottle and you can use that as a weapon wow so i think that saved me another thing that saved me was eat this is probably hard to believe, but it's absolute truth. Even in August, Michael would wear an ankle length thrift shop black wool coat. And he taught me to do this. The reason why you would wear these long baggy coats is to look, you could possibly be concealing something in that coat. Oh, okay. So people, if you, if you were, if you always wore baggy clothes, then the criminals, the, the people that would mug other people would size them up and go, okay, so they could possibly carry in all kinds of stuff and yeah. that clothes. So I would, uh, I started dressing that way as well. Very, very baggy and um you know you would all only wear boots you certainly would never wear any high heels or any kind right now lydia lunch was the only woman i knew who could get away with those stilettos <laughs> she was ferocious <laughs> you she would wear, weapons in themselves yeah she she made a big impression on me because of course she and michael were friend, good friends then yeah. and she um she would wear these stilettos and, and um, with what looked just like pantyhose, like black pantyhose. Yeah. That's yeah. it. Wow. And like skin tight. Oh, my and, gosh. And, and, and so, the, so the impression, the image that she gave 
to me, and I imagine to to anyone looking at her on the street, was that yeah, she was ferocious. Yeah. Oh you know, wow. She, she, she would use those things as a weapon. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and I watched her. I respected her, and I watched her, and I would see that she too would. She I learned from her a skill set that I still have if I, if I go up to that place. It's, um, you see something, you have this vision, you see something potentially unsavory mm-hmm. on the sidewalk up above. So without even blinking or making it obvious at all, you just, in the same pace, cross the street and go over to the other side. Oh, okay. Because you see, you, see, you see a possible confrontation. Yeah. So I saw her do that, and I was, okay, so then I learned it. So I was just walking at the same pace, really fast. You see some men, you don't know who they are, whatever. You just, not even blink, you just cross the street on the other side, keep going. You know? yeah. <laughs> and that way, yeah. you avoid all confrontation. That's smart. The, the other thing that happened with the neighborhood, I talk about this with my friends that had left there that were living there at the same time as me. The neighbors had changed throughout the years with the with the people that um, it was kind of like an infestation. The okay. people that would <laughs> the people that would come in there and then leave, come in there and leave. And a lot oh, of wow. them, which were what you call, um, you know, the bridge and tunnel, the people that would come in there on the weekends from places like Jersey, yeah. and then they would leave the bridge and tunnel, Brooklyn. <laughs> and you got to remember Brooklyn in those days. Brooklyn was not like it is now. No, no. Brooklyn was a place cab drivers wouldn't even take you sometimes. Yeah. They were like, nah, it's too far. Yeah. <laughs> so, so anyway, yeah, and, and by the way, when, when I first uh, went up there, forget about it. There's no taxi going to take you to Avenue A. Too dangerous. So the, the, the crazy thing was back on the, on the, the, the interesting stuff I went through uh, as a, a female in that neighborhood, uh, the uh, at one point the skinheads, ferocious, uh, racist skinheads, moved in. Yeah. And they were hanging out on the sidewalk, hanging out, and they would walk in a line, like an army. Okay. And they would walk. They would take up the entire width of the sidewalk. Oh, jeez. And if you didn't get out of their way, they would mow you down. Oh, jeez. They would just simply walk all over you and mow you down. They didn't care. <sighs> So I was walking, I was on 6th Street coming from, I was coming from 1st Avenue, I was walking home. So I turned the corner, I was on 6th Street, heading down to 6th and B. Okay. And there's this building there that's now an art uh, institution. It's like a big building that was always mysterious because it was always closed. It's got this dramatic front. It looks very uh, uh, utilitarian. It looks like something out of 1984 or something. It's got oh, this wow. bizarre front. Yeah, I think it used to be a Con Ed building or something. Anyway, okay. so electric company. Yeah, but, yeah. So I'm walking, I'm walking on the other side of the sidewalk from this thing. I'm going back. I'm not even looking over there. And I hear voices. And I don't look because you never look no. at someone <laughs> right. yelling at you. And what I heard was obscene language. Hmm. It was like, we're, com- we're coming after you. We're coming after you. And, uh, you know, and I realized it was because I had uh, what I was a very progressive in those days hairstyle. I had dreads and extensions. Right, yeah. So I had that look, and I got it for the very first time at a place in London and then at a place in, in uh, uh, Soho. And, you know, people like Boyd George and you know, everybody was getting this in the avant-garde kind of fashion hairstyle. Well, so see, yeah. now everybody's got this look, but I was one of the first. Right, yeah. So I had, I had, um, you know, I had this thick head of hair, multicolored dreadlocks and extensions, and they were very dramatic. They were different colors. Oh, but wow. see, to their eyes, any kind of a hairdo like that was, uh, you know, something they did not associate with, with me. Right. My skin. So, so they were racist. And so I continued to be, um, you know, on the edge the whole time those people lived in the neighborhood because I thought they would, they really, they probably really would have, yeah. if they'd been able to get me, they probably would have killed me. Oh my gosh. Jeez. Yeah. Horrible. Horrible. That's, oh gosh. That's, I, I hate hearing stuff like that. Well, this hairdo, which looked so good and was considered so iconic, 
you know, I had many photos uh, that are kind of well known now, you know, of, of me in those days. Yeah. They, um, this hairdo got me in trouble so many times in, in airports. Really? Because they thought I was, yeah, they thought I was smuggling stuff inside my hair. Oh, my God. And so wow. it happened in uh, Germany. And then when it happened at JFK, Al, the bass player, was waiting for me to pick me up uh, coming in from Europe. And I uh, was taken aside and the dogs were there. And the women came and took me into the room and searched me everywhere wow. to get my drift. Yeah. And I, I did not like that at all. I was beyond, um, I guess, felt kind of assaulted. Yeah. And so... They, and they said it was because of my hair. Well, so at that point, when you're traveling all over the place, you know, internationally, you just get fed up. So that very day, I, when I went home, I just took scissors and I whacked it off. I was like, see this? Wow. Yeah, I'm with this. Oh. From now on, I'm going to look the most conservative I could possibly be. Wow. Leave me alone. Oh, my gosh. So was that close to the end of your time in Swans? No, this is mid 80s. Okay. Okay. So, but you did end up leaving Swans in 97. And the final tour was 97. And then um, 98 is when the last uh, release came out when uh, Michael and I were still uh, together. Okay. And so uh, that, that mid 98 is when um, I started working on um, Anadoniac. Okay. And uh, he, at that time, was then going to start this Angels of Light project. And, and um, so at that point, um, things kind of came to a head because, of, uh, in my opinion anyway, uh, because of the fact that I couldn't tolerate the alcohol consumption anymore. And, and we had a lot of problems with that. And, of course, yeah. to his credit now, I think he's, he's been sober for quite a few years. Yeah. And I think that's wonderful. And I am um, thrilled that he's taken that step. But when we were together, this was a problem he, it was a big problem. Yeah. And uh, we had a member of the band on the last tour who ha was a, in, a recovered uh, alcoholic. Okay. And he had, he had been to uh, a rehab and, and uh, AA and all that. And he encouraged me to start going to Al-Anon, which is Friends and Families of Alcoholics. And so I started yeah. going two nights a week when Michael and I were still living together and, and okay. I, uh, I, I spent a lot of my time there and I had all kinds of advice. And so finally it became to, it came the concept of the concept of enabling kind of came on my doorstep and, and I didn't really think about it. And then I, I thought about how perhaps that that's what was going on, you know, that yeah. I, I was kind of, kind of being, in, in certain situations, good cop to, to, to his bad cop. And so I think okay. that I, re, I, I, I'm not happy with how it, how it played out. I think if I could have had, had the best of all worlds, it would have been that we would have gone together to figure out the issues and yeah. stop the problem. Because, um, I don't know. I mean, they, I mean, people say a tiger doesn't change his stripes, but, but I think that that added to a lot of stress and that added to a lot of the problems on the last tour and also just, just, you know, you're living with just daily, daily, daily. Yeah. And, and it, as anyone who's been through it is pretty hardcore. So I think he himself has talked about this. So I think that this had a lot to do with why that happened in my opinion. I think that that had a, could see from the outsider point of view or from my point of view, things were looking great. Okay. Things were looking in terms of the audience size, okay, in terms yeah. of the venues, in terms of the venues we played. Yeah. I saw finally after paying dues for so many years, thankless, never making any money, never having any kind of proper tour. Getting physically I assaulted. finally saw. Well, well, finally, you know, it got to the point of playing up prestigious, you know, venues like, like the Botanical Gardens in Belgium and, right. and, and selling out theaters. And so to me, I could see 
not only that, but the music to me was getting better and better and better. And um, so if I were to say, what is your favorite tour of, of all time when I was in it, it would definitely be the last, the 97 tour because of the fact that I crawled. Uh, I, I consider Hypo Girl and I crawled as, as um, the shining moments of my entire capability as a vocalist. Wow, yeah. And I crawled was really a pinnacle for me because I showcased in that one song every single voicing I could do. performance there was no uh, harmonizer no no affection i mean it was all through, coming from the body That's so, so i think too. that well it, well it was it was a theater piece for my head you know and, and the way i performed it was it was a theater piece you can see the characters and what's happening there yeah. and it's terrifying what happens and so so, so you know gut wrenching and so i think that i think that this is what i wanted to do and I think that if things had um, continued, you know, I would have liked to, the, the the ability to have more pieces along those lines, as well as to do more um, instrumental things like we did on that tour, which were quite beautiful. I mean, they were really kind of amazing and, and hypnotic. And I also think the dichotomy of the front person, of the male and female, was, was very effective. Oh, yeah, yeah. And so I think that... Um, you know, many fans, you know, that, that talk to me anyway, of course they're going to say this to me, but they, this was their favorite era because of the fact that they really, they enjoy that kind of, kind of um, back and forth with the yeah. male, the female energy. And so I, I would have to say this, this was, uh, uh, you know, I just saw it as getting better. In, in terms of the band, and yeah. so so I think that to then nip it in the bud and to end it, I, I just I thought it was insane. Were you, were you prepared? I just thought for it was insane, all? and and no one asked me what I thought about it. Yeah, uh, and so, so this is why on that last tour I didn't sign autographs. I didn't. I did one interview for an all female run radio station in Oslo. Yeah, and I I didn't. I I, I felt so angry. You know, oh, I had yeah. so many conflicted emotions about it, and and I still have those conflicted emotions about it, and it's still hard to talk about because wow. it just it just is inexplicable stupidity, in my opinion. And he said he didn't want to do the loud kind of stuff anymore. Well, then he went back to it. I was the first person to return to that, and and the reason why I did was neurosis asked me to perform with him. just as loud as ours was oh, wow. and they were ferocious I mean they were not they were deadly serious uh, uh, musicians and, and, and I and I was so happy for my training that I had in front because the thing I've learned in recording with guitar oriented the guitar player is like the quarterback it's like the guitar player is also a star to the singer so you step mm-hmm. out of the way of the guitars the singer always gives the guitar room to sing. Yeah, okay. And, my, and, and so 
of neurosis, I carefully constructed my vocals on our album around what the guitars were doing. So I gave passages for the guitars to step out and to express themselves. Without the training and, and funds and all the years of recording in studios and learning not to step on somebody else's part, then you learn the harmony involved in, in, the, in the ensemble. Right, right. The thing I've learned the most is listening. It, you can't stress this enough to musicians. They have got to listen to what everybody is doing. Listen right. to what all the other people are doing. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> when Swans ended, did you uh, did you have an idea of the musical direction you wanted to take from that point on, or had did you have anything written already that that you were working on? Or? Well, you figure you figure like the whole time during Swans. I was doing solo albums. Okay. So I did 13 Masks. I did Sacrificial Cake. I did uh, Beautiful People Limited. I did, I did, I did work, you know, yeah. with, with, on my own stuff and with collaborators. So it was just a continuation of, of me, you know, and, and okay. there was no interruption there. And uh, the Anadoniac album, which was the album, the first album that I did, that was a bold pioneering move on my part, again, I might add, because I completely self did it. I self-produced it. I self-released it. Yes. I self-manufactured it. So wow. people weren't doing that then. I had it made into a CD, had, had artwork made, and I sold it from the website. And it was even self-assembled by hand. Oh, wow. And, 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 and the, the actual artwork of the original edition was wearing a belt around it. Uh, that that leaped over the actual you know uh, outside part of the of the of the art, yeah, and yeah. that oh, was wow. to reference the photographs and the photographs were done were done by famed photographer Richard Kern. Oh wow! And Richard yeah. Kern is is a legend, and and yeah. you know he, he he New York Girls he he filmed many uh, Lydia Lunch videos. The guy is is whole part of that whole. Um, that whole scene yeah, uh, yeah. Know, up there. And, and he, um, he, he himself, instead of calling himself an artist, he called himself a pornographer. He was very tongue in cheek about yeah. what he did. And <laughs> so I flew up there and I did these photos with Kimberl Fowler, who's also legendary, the luxurious horror of Karen Black. Kimbra, um, did the, uh, did my makeup. And so I have theatrical oh, wow. gore makeup. So the gore makeup made me look like I was cut, bleeding, and wounded. And yeah. then I had the idea that I would wear, because uh, anadoniac is the word I constructed. Anadonia is the, the addiction to the inability to experience pleasure. Oh, wow. So an okay. anadoniac, an anadoniac, is is the person who is who is like that, and I added the act because it was referencing alcoholic, and it was uh, referencing maniac. Oh, so this was okay. an album. So this album was dedicated to Michael and to all the members of Florence, oh, and that was the sole purpose of the album was a commentary on him and those years in Florence. So it's a very um, bold and extremely, you know, in the face kind of a, kind of an album, mm -hmm. and it came from from a place of extreme, and I can't even exaggerate that pain. Wow. And I think a lot of people, you know, like I did an interview with a woman in Poland about a month ago, and she was like, "This is our favorite album here. You know, we love it." Yeah. And I've had people in, April, people in Eastern Europe tell me how much that album resonates with them, and wow. so it could be because it's it's like totally in your face with with the pain, and you know, and then it has a track called "Honey." with acoustic guitar, which ends with the sound of buzzing bees. So it's, it's uh, uh, and, and then the lyrics, you know, about all the things that, that a person can't do anymore, you know, they, yeah. they can't, they can't kiss, they can't kick, uh -huh. they can't abuse you anymore, yeah. they can't love you anymore, they can't abuse you anymore. So, so it's a, it's a, a love song from the point of view of a person who, who um, is, it's a bittersweet uh, memory. You can't leave me You can't erode what's empty You can't explode the memory Your fingers trip with a 
mm-hmm. with, with honey at the end, and it's it's that's a, you can draw your own analogy with that. But but yeah. I think that that um, you know, and so then I had directly confronted um, autobiographical facts um, and, and the song in a Daniac with me sitting at my childhood organ playing that part. It's not a sample; it's live, oh, wow. and I recorded it with a. a Sony cassette recorder, small cassette recorder, sitting on the on the bench with me as I played, because I wanted to get the sound of the pedals and all the action of the keys. Yeah, yeah. So that was what started the song, and I also explored all of my voicing. So I get really high, really squeaky high, really piercing <laughs> high, and then I get very, very low and guttural on some of them as well. And I'm a killer. I'm a killer is autobiographical. It references a, a moment on the last tour when the whole band was looking at me doing a check, like in a state of shock, because every single night the set was being tweaked and changed. Oh, wow. Every single night. And this was the no sleep tour. This was the sleep or eat tour. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you can't do both. Yeah. <laughs> oh, so, wow. You're exhausted. Yeah. You're barely able to stand up. You're so wiped out. And yet again, you have to change something. You can't just relax and get into the groove and really give it your all for right. music. You have to keep remembering, okay, so tonight after the eighth this, we change to that, and then we do that three times, and then we and then, so change. Wow. So, so, so in other words, it was constantly being reworked. So when you have a group of people in a state of exhaustion, tempers flare, mm-hmm. and um, this eye staring at us, it was, it was basically, it was like, staring at me rather, it was like, what, you, do something about it, is what they were saying. Oh, and geez. so at that point, at that point, I just, I just, I, I mean, it was all metaphor. I would never hurt anybody like this, but, right. but I mean, it was all metaphor. At this point in the situation, I was just like, no. We're not going to do it. Right. And then Michael Will, Michael whirled around. He was like, what? What did you say, Jarbo? Oh. I said, we're not going to do it. We're tired. We just want to play. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, my God. You know? <laughs> so a classic, a classic, 